Thank you. Uh, hi there, and thank you for uh, showing up today. Um, it's a great pleasure to see so many people uh, on site. Uh, that's a long time um, since we have had so big gatherings. But today we will talk about the functional MRI because I haven't, I, I feel sometimes because I've been do, working with MR scans uh, for the last 12, 13 years, and I sometimes feel that people, when they talk about MR, they say, ah, yeah, it's, it's fancy and sexy, but ah, let's see what it shows. So uh, today I have just, um, uh, I've, I, I think I will show you why we think it's ah, blah, blah, something nice and fancy to see, but yeah. really don't give nothing. And what we have actually learned from, from all these MR scans. So these two things will be uh, touched on today. First of all, I think you need to see my disclosures, and you have them here. And I have uh, nothing uh, in relation to this uh, lecture here. So first of all, if we want to know something about migraine, why do we do all these MR scans? We need some biomarkers of the disease. We need some understanding of the pathophysiology, underlying mechanisms. A biomarker, in traditional understanding, a biomarker is two things. One is something you can identify a pathology or you can, uh, in, in a single patient, or you can uh, identify a, a trend, a pathological trend in a group of patients. So at the moment, we don't have, and we have never had a uh, imaging, neuroimaging biomarker of migraine. We have one of the migraine aura. That's something, yes, Professor Yes Olesen uh, identified many years ago. But for the migraine as a headache disorder, we don't have any biomarker. We cannot just scan like broken arm, show the broken bone, and say, yeah, that's the problem. So that's something we want to find on MRI, but we have at the moment nothing. The next thing is underlying mechanism. The underlying mechanisms of migraine are very complex. The disease is also complex. Although, yes, Professor Jos Olesen um, made these, or led the group who made these classification criteria, the patients are still very heterogeneously uh, presenting their symptoms. As uh, our patient uh, association representant, uh, Anne Bülow Olsen, told me yesterday, she thinks that we should have smaller groups of patients and identify these patients. And I totally agree. But the problem is that we can have two small groups and then we will end up with five, six patients in a group. And we cannot, we cannot find trends or underlying mechanisms. So what we have is what I will present you today. First of all, if we want to look at the migrant patient, they are in five uh, conditions at any given time. First, they are asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms. Some people, they claim that these patients can be photophobic all the time. Uh, other, pa other patients could have some craving behaviors or uh, allodynia or something. But most patients, they are completely normal. Like me, I have a migraine. Today, I don't have any problem uh, with my head. <laughs> I'm a little bit tired, but that's, I have an explanation for that. Um, <laughs> So then we have the prodromal phase. Here, patients, I will go through the descriptions of all these phases uh, in the next slide. We have the aura, then we have the headache, and the headache is something everyone is, oh, oh, sorry, it disappeared here. The, the aura is, uh, sorry, the headache phase is something we are focusing on because that's the phase we see the patients. That's also the face uh, headache, uh, which has the interest of companies. So most, most research is done uh, in patients in the headache phase. Because we, 
we need to treat the pain. We need to, to have uh, uh, pain-free patients uh, with, with whom we can talk with, speak with, uh, examine. It's very difficult to examine a patient with full-blown migraine attack with, uh, with uh, um, uh, worst, most severe headache ongoing. So we need to have them treated, and then we can investigate them. And then we have the post dromal phase, and we go back to the asymptomatic phase. So this is the life of every migraine patient. We are either in the asymptomatic phase or one of the symptomatic phases. So the descriptions of uh, the migraine phases, we have the asymptomatic phase. The duration is variable. For, no, for some people, it's one day. For some people, it's uh, 30 days or 60 days. Mostly patients, they have some, if you have a chronic migraine patient, they have a, um, a duration of the asymptomatic phase, uh, uh, at least uh, half, uh, you know, uh, half a month because they need to have 15 days with headache and at least eight days with migraine. And the symptoms, uh, they are none. They don't have any symptoms. Then we have the prodromal phase. And I think it's the, 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 the font size is a little bit too small, but I will just go through this. Have you in a pointer? Ah, it's there. Yes. So, um, according to the classification, there is a little bit, uh, we have this classification, the migraine criteria, and uh, it's not directly in the criteria, but in the comments to the criteria, uh, we have this, that uh, the prodromal phase can uh, um, vary from hours to days, uh, to two days. And what we have are symptoms like fatigue, uh, various combinations of fatigue, difficulty in concentration, neck stiffness, sensitivity to light, to, to sound, and uh, nausea, blurred vision, yawning, or um, other symptoms. But that's something we see in this patient. That's, these are the symptoms that are described in the classification. So we have the aura. Aura is much more precisely described in the classification. It lasts, the, and uh, every single aura symptom lasts from five minutes to 60 minutes. Uh, and it uh, it's, uh, consists of one or more of the following fully reversible neurological symptoms, which uh, um, is visual symptoms, sensory symptoms, speech, language, motor, uh, brain stem, or uh, retinal uh, symptoms. Then we go to the headache phase. It lasts for four, uh, from four to 72 hours untreated or unsuccessfully treated. And uh, you have the headache. And uh, associated with the headache, you have some uh, symptoms, either nausea uh, slash uh, vomiting, or you have photo and phonophobia. And then you go to the post-dromal phase, uh, which is uh, up to 48 hours, according to the classification. Um, here, patients, they feel tired. Uh, they also uh, complain about difficulty in concentration, neck stiffness. So now you can see that we need to examine these patients in a well-described phase to get information on the MR scan. Because it's a patient who, has, uh, who is labeled as a non-headache patient, because we usually say, ah, we have this uh, headache versus no headache days. We compare this. Uh, or we have asymptomatic patients. We compare this with healthy controls. And we found something. Other people, they don't find anything on the scans. But one thing which has not been uh, described in all these uh, MR studies uh, are if these patients were maybe in the postdromal phase or maybe in the, sorry, prodromal phase or the postdromal phase, then they have some symptoms and there should be some, something changed in the brain. So that's something which we have to keep in mind when we are doing MR studies. So let's see if it's true what I'm telling you here. Let's go to the next slide here. Why do we use MR scans? First of all, we have very high resolution on MR scans. 
I'm not saying that we can't use other types of scans, but MR scans, they give us, the, at the moment, the best resolution. You can see here, for comparison, the CT scan. Also, uh, the PET scans, you uh, basically use a CT scan. Uh, and here you have the MR scan. We also have no radiation with MR scans. And that allows us to uh, do these repeated scans, so we don't add some radiation to the patient. But we can also have longitudinal long sequence scan sequences where we can do everything simultaneously in the same patient. You can do the functional MRI, you can do the structural MRI, vascular imaging uh, at the same time in these patients. So they can be there for one hour, one and a half hour in the scanner, and we can get a lot of information in these scanners. So, so that's the reason we are using MR scans in patients. In this uh, overview lecture, I will look at patients uh, who have been um, investigated with resting state and with task-based functional MRI. What is the difference? Resting state, you have a patient lying, resting in the scanner. You're not doing anything with this patient. So what we see are every single voxel or every single area of the brain is uh, expressing a small curve here. This is the activity, a signal. It's a bold signal. In MR, we, we measure bold signals. Functional MR, we measure bold signals. This is a bold signal which uh, comes out from at, uh, every single voxel in the brain. And if we have two voxels, two different places, with almost the same um, curves, then we say that they are connected. So what we look at when we see resting state functional MRI, we looked at connections. So it's brain connectivity we are looking at. So you can say, oh, um, it really doesn't look like something which is connected. But yeah, if you met, compared with this one, you will see that this is much more connected. So everything we are looking at in the resting state measurements is relative, relative to other uh, signals we get from the brain. So it's not 100% the same, but it's almost the same if you look at several thousand different signal curves. If we move to the task-based, then we have a task. We ask patients to do something. It's in the, the old study, uh, you can also call it a Olesen test. Again, U.S. <laughs> Olesen invented this test with patients uh, who were uh, contracting their hand. Is it right? Yes. And then you could uh, measure the cerebral blood flow uh, on the contralateral side in the motor hemisphere. So here, what we are doing is actually we are asking the patient to do something, to look in a uh, checkerboard. You have black and white colors. They are alternating. And when you see this, you activate, you stimulate the vision. And then we can see a signal in the occipital cortex. You could also do the same, uh, the, the Olesen test with the patients, and we would see a, 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 a signal in the motor cortex. Uh, so, so that's how this works. So here we have no stimulation. Then we have the stimulation, no stimulation, stimulation, no stimulation. And you can see that when we stimulate, we get some activity. When we don't stimulate, we, we, don't, we have the baseline activity here. So this is called task-based. And we have many different types of tasks. We, we have pain stimulation where patients are lying in the scanners. We, we have uh, visual stimulation. We have also um, olfactory stimulation. So we can stimulate with different type of stimuli in the, in the scanner and see if it's um, how the patient reacts. Then you can compare a patient with the attack with a patient outside the attack or a, a given migraine phase. And you can see if you get the same signal out of this patient, this is maybe the asymptomatic phase. You do the same test in a symptomatic phase, 
and then you will compare if you get the same, uh, same signals as you did in the asymptomatic phase. So that's basically how we compare these uh, patients or uh, uh, different phases. So let's look at the asymptomatic phase with resting state. Here, my colleague, Anas Hugard. Anas, are you here? No. Anas just solved the, 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 you know, um, the case here. He found no abnormalities in brain connectivity in the asymptomatic phase. At that time, he did this. Uh, this is an original study, not a review. At the, at the time he did this study, he took all the resting state networks which were presented or proposed as something uh, different in migraine patients, and he tested them. Every single uh, network which was proposed to be different in migraine patients, he tested them, and he found nothing. Okay? So, a few years uh, later, this is a a um, review uh, done by a European Headache uh, Federation's uh, School of Advanced uh, Studies, uh, SAS, uh, review group. We have these meetings, uh, we had them before uh, COVID, uh, where we gather people from different places in Europe, headache specialists, and they uh, have some, some courses, but they also do some collaborations, and this group collaborated uh, on resting state functional imaging in migraine, what have we learned? And here you can see, if you, um, if you go through all the studies with resting state in migraine patients, you can find uh, abnormalities in all these areas and the connections. So what have we learned actually here? Allow me to say that we need better uh, studies to learn something. And this is maybe the main reason why people, they lost their faith in, my, in uh, migraine imaging. Because they say, ah, oh, everything, every, every uh, new study shows something new and maybe not. And so, but let's see, let's see. If we look at the different phases which are well described, which is a new trend which is uh, upcoming now and people are doing more to to describe the patient in which phase they are, which symptoms they have during the scan, maybe we can get something. And we, we got something when we look at this. Look here. This is a study done by Anna Sugat. He had patients, migraine with aura patients, with always aura in the same site. So it's a site fixed aura. Then he... Uh, took these patients a day without aura. They did not have the migraine visual aura. They came, he scanned them, and he compared the symptomatic hemisphere with the asymptomatic hemisphere. And he saw that there was a difference when he asked them to look at the, the, the checkerboard. So he did some visual stimulation, and he saw that there was a difference between the symptomatic and the asymptomatic phase within the patients. He also um, did another uh, study, uh, sorry, another comparison, where he looked at the symptomatic uh, hemisphere corresponding to control hemispheres. And here, he looked at the asymptomatic uh, uh, hemisphere corresponding to the control hemisphere where it found nothing. Its control is healthy controls. So there was nothing there. So actually, uh, we know in these patients, they can be a little bit hyper excitable in the symptomatic hemisphere in the interictal period in, in migraine with aura patients. And that, this is related to the aura. We also have now let's move to the um, task based outside of our group. This study is from uh, Leiden. And what they did, they stimulated the patients on a not traditional way, but they asked them to ingest glucose. After glucose, 
they looked at the bold signal which came out from the hypothalamus. And they saw that when you get this glucose, um, and after some, uh, some minutes, the bold signal in the, um, in the hypothalamus normalizes. So they use GTN. GTN is a nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a well-known uh, inducer of migraine. If you give nit nitroglycerin to a patient with migraine, 80, mm, there is 80% risk that this patient will develop a migraine attack. So, so they took some healthy controls. They, they, give, uh, they gave them uh, nitroglycerin, uh, or either nitroglycerin or nothing. And they saw that there was actually no difference between the signal and the normalization of the hypothalamic bolt signal after glucose stimulation. Then they looked at migraine patients who got nitroglycerin and control subjects, healthy controls, who got nitroglycerin. And here they saw that the migraine patients, they normalized faster than the healthy controls. So there was a difference in the hypothalamic uh, activity. Then they looked at the patients, migraine patients, uh, to see if this is just something which has to do with migraine patients or it's maybe something which has to do with the symptoms in migraine patients. They uh, gave some of these patients nitroglycerin and some of these patients had no nitroglycerin. And here you can see there is a clear difference. The patients who got nitroglycerin, they uh, normalized rapidly compared to those without. And this was during the prodromal symptoms. They described the prodromal symptoms in these patients. It was before the patients, they developed a migraine attack. But after nitroglycerin, before they get this attack, this is the prodromal phase, and this showed that there was a difference in the hypothalamus. Maybe there was also differences other places in the brain, but they focused on uh, hypothalamus, and that's how it works with MR studies. You can't focus on everything because then you have to have the patient in the scanner for 10 hours. That's, uh, that's impossible. So the conclusion here, uh, the hypothalamus is hyper -ex uh, excitable uh, during the prodromal symptoms in migraine patients. Does it make sense, Haida? Thanks. Haida confirmed. Let's look at another study. This is actually a case report. Um, but it's a very strong <coughs> case report. Because what they did here, uh, it, that's Laura Schulte and Anne May from uh, the Hamburg group. They had one patient they scanned every single day for 30 days. And they not only scanned the patient every day, we thought that Danish Vikings were tough people. They said uh, yes to everything. But one patient here in Hamburg also said yes to be stimulated with obnoxious stimuli uh, every single day for 30 days. And they saw this uh, bold signal. And here you can see the blue bar here is the preictal phase. Then you have the ictal, and you have the postictal here. Uh, the postictal is the preictal is actually 24 hours before the 24-hour uh, scan prior to attack day. And here in the preictal, they had some symptoms with craving and heightening of the perceptions. It's not well described in this patient which uh, other symptoms this patient uh, had, but. It, he was in the uh, three times he was in the pre ictal or the prodromal phase during uh, this study. Sorry, here. Here we have what they found. There was increased um, bold signal from the hypothalamus during noxious stimulation in this patient. Noxious, they have this olfactometer and they gave some noxious stimulation, pain stimulation from the olfactometer in the scanner. So, so the conclusion here, here is again hyper excitability in the hypothalamus during the prodromal uh, symptoms in migrant patients. 
So two different groups, one from Netherlands, one from Germany, two different methods to, to provoke, and we get the same uh, result here. So that's something which is very strong in MR research. That's if you can reproduce something, not with the same method, but with uh, another type of study. I don't know, I don't hear the result of this hypothalamic discussion yesterday. Who won? Against. Against. Okay. They said there was no, uh, they said there was no um, premonitory symptoms in this case before they found the yeah. That's also something I, because I'm also a little bit against this hypothalamic. <laughs> so um, I, I wrote uh, together with Roberta Messina, Cedric, and Rune. Where is Rune? We, we wrote this um, uh, review. Uh, it has been accepted yesterday. And you can read it in the current opinion of neurology. And I'm a little bit against, so I really read this paper several times. And I can't find the text saying that there was no symptoms during this phase. They write that there were some symptoms, some symptoms, but they don't write which symptoms or if these symptoms were during the scan. So I cannot, I cannot say that we had no symptoms here. But next time we meet Arne and Laura, we can ask them. Maybe they, they have the data still. So let's. Okay. Yeah. Anne is uh, it's it's a very good friend of us. We meet uh, every year for these Hamcop meetings, Hamburg Copenhagen meetings, and and we can ask him because, as I know Anne, he he say he gives statements like full stop. <laughs> so we we don't need to 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 think. Ah, oh, maybe he meant. Uh, or, so we can ask yes or no. So. Let's do that. But still, what we have in the literature today, if we ask someone uh, to do this review, they will come up with, this, uh, with these studies. It would be pretty then sure that if there were premonitory symptoms in association with the scan, it would be mentioned in the paper. <laughs> That's a, a, a good uh, argument, yeah. So. But we can, we can do it here, so we have the third center, and we can see if we can, we can reproduce this. So let's jump to the next, and here is something um, <laughs> Professor Nushin Hajikani from Boston uh, had one basketball player uh, who uh, got visual aura um, after uh, long exercise sessions. So they ask this patient to do, uh, play basketball for, I think, 90 minutes or something. He got this aura. They kicked him in the scanner and did this uh, MR scan during migraine aura. And this is one very, this, this is very rare in headache uh, imaging that you get migraine aura caught in the scanner. So this, is, this was the first patient we, uh, we, we, we know of with MR scans. And here you can see this is before, before the aura. There is a actually normal signal here. You stimulate, you don't stimulate, you stimulate. It's a, it's a visual stimulation again. And, uh, and it, it's, it's normal, it's baseline. Here with alpha, here the patient got these aura symptoms. And here you can see there is increased uh, bold signal in this phase. And after that, it decreases. Uh, after uh, minutes, it decreases here. It starts decreasing. So this was interpreted as uh, increased bold signal during positive aura symptoms and decreased during scotoma in this one patient. Yes, the smiling, because I think you, you are thinking, I showed this many years ago. <laughs> before the MR scan was invented, but that's, that's true uh, because, yes, actually showed this uh, in a 
a larger group of patients with SPECT scans in the, the early 80s, or maybe the, the, the experiments were, were done in the 70s, but it was the, the, the paper from 1981, which has been cited maybe more than 2,000 times. Um, and it's good that we can reproduce such studies because then we can also build upon this knowledge and examine more. So now we just uh, made sure that we saw the same thing which was shown before. Here, this study is uh, from uh, Danish Headache Center. My colleague uh, Nana Ankrem and uh, Anna Sukhan, they uh, were pre, uh, the, 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 the uh, primary investigators here. And I know that Masood kicked them to do this uh, because we had to find some patients with aura. So if people do something with one patient, we need to do this in five patients. So we did this with five patients. Here is just one example from one patient. You can see here, this is the baseline scan. This is the bold signal, the change in bold signal, uh, the baseline and the, and the interictal. And this patient had a scotoma in the... Uh, uh, right side, and you have this left-sided hemisphere, which is the symptomatic hemisphere, and there is a difference. It's a negative oral symptom. You have decrease in bold signal. And here, in the contralateral hemisphere, there is nothing. This is only for, for one patient, but they had five patients in this study with aura, which has been described. So the conclusion is uh, the same. Increased bold signal during positive oral symptoms and symptoms, uh, sorry, uh, during positive uh, oral symptoms uh, and decreased during scotoma in migraine with oral patients. And this is again two different types of study because in this study the oral symptoms were provoked by hypoxia. They gave either hypoxia or placebo, and when they had this hypoxia, five patients, I don't uh, remember out of how many, uh, but five patients, they got this oral symptoms and they were scanned. So again, we have two different studies with the same message that we have uh, increased bold signal and decrease in um, uh, positive and negative oral symptoms. Then we jump to the, <coughs> uh, to the attack phase, the headache phase. There are not so many studies during the headache phase because, as I told you, it's very difficult to investigate patients during ongoing migraine attacks. They are complaining about the headache. If you put them in a scanner, how many of you have been MR scanned? Oh, that's many. You know one thing. There is a lot of noise in this MR scan. And another thing, for many people, when they just enter the MR scan, they feel that now it's just... You are dizzy. So what happens with a patient who has photophobia, increased sound sensitivity, and maybe a little bit dizzy, severe headache, you put this patient in a scanner with a very loud noise, some of these patients, they will vomit in the scanner. So, and what you need the patients to do, they are just lying still here and not move the head. And to to, to avoid that these patients move their heads, you fixate them with foam pads. So actually they can't. So they, they can actually aspirate their vomit and uh, that's, that, that's not good, you know that. <laughs> that's something they can die from. So that's not, the, that's not what we what we'd want them. So it's very, very difficult to scan patients during ongoing migraine attacks. But here in this study, we scanned 19 patients. It's my own study. Sorry for showing that, but it's one of the few studies we have. And I was also kicked by my mentor, Masudashina, to do this study. Uh, and I wanted to show that this was something which is feasible to do. Because if we want to see what the problem is, again, we need to scan during the ongoing problem. But still, you have to have one runner. One should, uh, you know be with the computer, one should be with the door. In the same second, the patient just push on the button, I am too bad, you have to run. And it takes five, six seconds, so you can be in, put, pull the patient out, and just move the heads. 
So this is something which is not easy. It's difficult. So what we did in this study, it is a resting state study. And um, here we looked after the thalamus, the thalamic networks. So we had one seed. Uh, we placed the seed here. The seed means that you ask the computer, the software, if I put the region of interest here, can you tell me how many areas are connected to this? How many other places in the brain have the same signal uh, rhythm as this uh, given uh, region of interest? So we uh, looked after this uh, right and left telemic areas, and we saw all this. This is in the normal, uh, in the normal uh, state. This is the network. Uh, uh, for the bilateral thalamic uh, seeds. And what we saw in this patient, we scanned them one day without headache and one day with migraine attacks. And I can uh, admit it's, uh, it, this study was done in 2013, and at that time I had no clue about, uh, or um, I had a clue about that they could have premonitor symptoms and something else they could be in the but I actually don't know yes was the all these different phases were were this described in the previous classification mm -hmm. okay sorry <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the time it was not usual to to ask for all these other symptoms but most patients they came when they were feeling completely well for the for the uh, baseline scan which was headache free and if they had some symptoms, they would have tell, told us, but it's not, that's not the true, because sometimes they have symptoms, they just, ah, that's normal for me, and they don't tell about it. So you have to actually to ask this patient. But although we didn't ask, we saw something which was uh, altered, and there was changed connectivity between the thalamus and the cortical areas, which was pain-related cortical areas. It was the sensory motor cortex. It was the occipital cortex, um, and in other studies they have also shown um, alterations in the pons. So, so these are the, co uh, the different locations we normally relate with pain. So we could actually see here that they, these patients were in pain state when they came to uh, the ictal scan. We can say that this is migraine specific, but we can say that different areas in the brain related to pain was affected. We don't have so much time left, so let's just jump to the last phase, the prodromal phase. This is the less investigated uh, phase. We only have this uh, uh, report from the same study where they scanned the patients uh, during 30 days, and you can see here that in this post ictal uh, phase, they report uh, still hyper excitability of the occipital cortex. So this is uh, the conclusion. So if you want to have some take home messages, what have we actually learned from using MR scans uh, in migraine? We know that in the prodromal phase, or literature tell us that in the prodromal phase, there is hyper excitability of the hypothalamus. Visual cortex is hyper excitable during the visual aura. And um, there is a disruption uh, of uh, ascending pain networks during the migraine attack. And in the post phase, you have hyper excitability of the visual cortex. So there is something, and I avoided showing you the asymptomatic phase because I don't think that we have something reproducible in the asymptomatic phase as it is right now. But in some years, when we can have some more, some small, more you know, homogeneous groups of patients, maybe we can also find something in the in the asymptomatic phase. Thank you. That was the last word, and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Faisal. Very nice presentation. Um, Andreas will uh, take this part of the room, and I will take the other part for the questions. And we have no questions from the viewers online, so it's only from the audience here. Any questions? Everything was so clear. So oh, <laughs> Cedric. Peter. Uh, Pierre. Uh, Pierre. You're speaking about uh, Mikkel with aura most of the time. What is the difference between Mikkel with aura and Mikkel without aura in your examinations? Um, the studies we have done, we have actually not compared all the results we have uh, between migraine with and without aura. We have different studies. Anna Suga did all the studies with uh, migraine with aura. I did without aura. but. Uh, we found something different, but we have not asked the same questions in the different studies. So that's something we can do to have one, uh, you know, one large group with mixed patients and, and scan them. There are some studies uh, telling us that there could be some, some differences, but we found no differences in the functional. Uh, we have not investigated for, fun for differences. So. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amin. Cédric Gollion from Toulouse. I have a question. So you have pointed out some discrepancies in the results, maybe due to difficulties in methodology and to have uh, consistent results. So in your opinion, in 2022, what should we prioritize? Should we prioritize um, same kind of methodology with usual three Tesla MRI, whole brain analysis, and deep learning algorithm to find um, to find results data-driven, or to investigate into seven Tesla uh, MRI, better MRI, MRI resolution, and continue with uh, hypothesis-driven in analysis? Mm. Thank you. Very, very good question. So you are asking me if you just have a stronger scanner with higher re resolution, could you just do the same studies and get something more uh, understandable? No. You will got, uh, get a uh, you know, much more noise if you get uh, increased because uh, what, you know, what you need is you need to have homogeneous groups. So one of the most perfect studies I showed you here was Anas Hugard's study with the side fixed aura because then he just found a small group of patients with always aura in the same side. Look at these patients. He just took all the hemispheres put them on the other side, checked against the hemispheres. It's a very, very, very strong study. And, and this is something which is, uh, in, in my opinion, which we should do in 2022. And maybe it's difficult for every single small group to have this, this big material uh, of patients. So you can have like 20 patients with side fix aura in one group. Um, because this is not something you can get in one PhD study time. Uh, so maybe we should have some consortium uh, across different groups and just add with patients so we can put this, okay, this patient's <coughs> side fix aura, this patient only visual aura, this patient had have never pulsating headache when they have their migraine attacks, these patients are always pulsating, always same side pulsating headache. So you have small groups which are well-defined uh, based uh, on their phenotypes, um, and then I think we can get something. And I think we can use the three Tesla scanner uh, for much more uh, at the moment. So we don't need to go to the seven Tesla. Hi. Um, what about other modalities of imaging, like NMR imaging? Is there anything to get from there, metabolic things going on? Um, Yes, uh, there are some, some, uh, some studies uh, investigating lactate and uh, uh, other metabolites during, uh, but that was not the focus of this. Uh, but th there are some, uh, and I'm sure that you can also find a review on all these uh, metabolic uh, studies uh, using MR scans. And other modalities, we have 
when you say mod modalities, you mean either uh, PET scans, SPECT scans, EEGs, or, or you mean sequences. Uh, because in MR, you have a sequence for the functional, you have for the structural imaging, you have for the vascular imaging, angiographies, uh, you have for the blood-brain barrier. So you have different sequences. But people are doing all these different. The focus here was the functional imaging. Um, <clears throat> the problem with this MR is, of course, that there are so many parameters and you can, you can uh, intensify the amplification, you can make it smaller, and uh, there are all sorts of uh, chances that investigators can, can fool themselves uh, to find something that's not real. And I'm just wondering whether we're not go getting to the point now where it should be required for all positive MR studies that there is a replication. It has already for years been standard in genetic studies. You can't publish any genetic findings without having an independent replication sample and replicate your results. So what do you think about that? This is a very good comment because I 100% uh, agree with you uh, that we need to have replication, but I don't think we can, at the moment, we can have uh, a requirement that you have to repeat, but what we can do is, I also suggested this in one of the papers, review papers, um, I was in uh, the senior author on this SAS EHF group with review, I suggested that we should have some, uh, some, some guidelines on how you present and which methods you, because as you say that you can, if you don't find something on the conventional resting state, you can go to the FA, you can check different other things, uh, just do some statistical uh, and, uh, you know, analysis and find something else uh, or change the threshold. Uh, so we need to have some some uh, guidelines or of what you and people like you can today publish a paper if you don't tell that the patients were recruited according to the migraine criteria I, I, the IHS criteria for migraine. You should also have as a, as a control mechanism there that you can say, okay, we use this mechanism which is uh, recommended by the guidelines. Because so what you're saying is a consensus. You need the consensus. So yesterday presented that from, from psychiatry. They created this kind of consensus that it is must when you do uh, imaging status. And uh, regarding metabolic, we have the same problem, like with a functional, uh, because the findings are quite inconsistent. Mm. Uh, uh, and that's why we need a consensus, and we need, we need to use the same methodology, and maybe also, as you said, replications. Because otherwise, it seems that the MRI findings or imaging findings are quite a mess right now. Because we have positive, we have negative, and it's very difficult to publish negative data. Because everybody wants to have a positive data, uh, which uh, kind of uh, confirmed the previous findings. If it's not, it's difficult to publish that. So that's why we need a consensus of uh, imaging in headache research. You know, for the PET, for the MRI, for functional, for structural, for metabolic. It's very, very important. Yeah. This is something you can suggest I, and I, lead, Faisal. I al already talked with uh, Professor Noshin Hajikani about this some months ago, um, uh, because that's also something we s suggested in the review paper, that there should be some consensus about what you're using, because uh, it's, it's very difficult to come out with, ah, now 10 people, uh, 10 groups published this. I found nothing when I, so you don't have any chance to get published. So, uh, so, so the, it's a good point, and I think we should work on that. Thank you, Faisal. We have one last question from the online viewers. Any changes having association with the total duration of migraine illness? Um, in what I presented, no. Uh, but there are some color, uh, um, 
correlation studies uh, showing uh, that you can have changes uh, correlated to the duration of disease. But again, that has not been, uh, that has not been uh, reproduced. Um, and that's something we should do. I also want to emphasize that the, the, the studies I, I included here to show you today were, were studies which had been re replicated at least one time by another group using another methodology. Uh, so, so that's what I, and I, all these non-conventional measures where they use different thresholds, I just kicked all this out from this presentation because not to confuse people. Okay? Thank you, Faisal, for an excellent presentation.